I got this book here when I was a kid. It's made from some American Boy Scout organization by this dude here, who is about as Native American as he is a Japanese geisha girl. He was an Italian-American named Oscar de Corti, whose facial features happened to correspond somewhat to what mid to late 20th century white people like to imagine that Native Americans were supposed to look like. So Oscar, he decided that he was really a Native American. He became this kind of public figure, appearing in movies, parading around these costumes, figuring in books like this one. Now, this kind of native cosplay behavior is actually also here in uh, Northern Europe. Europe, believe it or not. It was a thing in DDR, in communist Eastern Germany. And dig this, Adolf Hitler himself was so into native, native Americans that he made them honorary Aryans. Psst. You're blocking my shot. Thank you. We interrupt this regularly scheduled programming of Hitler Taika Waititi in a feather headdress to bring to you. And even here in Scandinavia, this basically fraudulent stuff incredibly made its way all the way into Danish and into a small local library in central Jutland where I was able to pick it up as a kid. Dude, white people are weird. Who said that? This is the Naughty Animism channel where I communicate about recovering that traditional animist knowledge of Northern Europeans, uh, the practice of human kinship with the land that has been rejected through modernization. If you like this project, then consider supporting me through Patreon or checking out my web shop, subscribing to my channel and all that. Some culture is owned or sacred. Wearing a tail feather of an eagle among the Lakota can be a sign of a specific status that would perhaps be awarded through a rite of passage into manhood where you also receive a new name or something like that. And that meaning is undermined if whatever dude just runs along and covers himself in eagle feathers because, because reasons. He thinks it's funny to fancy himself some kind of stereotype imagination of American indigeneity. That is the reason that some people are not particularly big fans of those kinds of cultural exchange that can legitimately be labeled cultural appropriation. It can actually be an attack on people's culture. And this is a form of uh, oppression, really. However, some cultures not owned. Just one example is that I would tend to mostly classify words like that. Words just float around. About 70% of the language that I speak right now is vocabulary that originates outside of Anglo-Saxon. So using words like shaman or totem are, in my view, not cases of appropriation. And the arguments that I've seen making that case don't look strong. They sometimes focus on the fact that such words change meaning when they become loan words into another language, and that's evident. The opposite is unthinkable. Words change meaning all the time. They even change meaning when they don't change language. Slap, I thought, I think this is slap. No, it's in a good way. It's in a good way. In a good way. These changes in meaning are then sometimes cast with a, for instance, woke identitarian purity rhetoric of contamination, dilution, misrepresentation, degradation, and so on. Yoo -hoo that rests on this identitarian idea that culture can be bastardized from this serene state of nationalist purity, and then it becomes this hodgepodge thing. But dudes and dudettes and dudicus, culture always is a hodgepodge. It's supposed to be a hodgepodge. 
that it's sometimes not as a racist purity fetish, which is incredibly problematic. Humans are fairly transgressive and chaotic beings. Misunderstandings, transformations, mixings are not only a constant in human transfers of meaning, they are extremely important positive elements of what it means to be human. Words can of course be used for oppressing and degrading, but that's a little bit of a different thing. There's no for instance degradation in the way that I use the originally Anishinaabe word totem. And I'm just gonna try to follow that one all the way home. <laughs> so hang in there. Totem is a word I use a lot. Let's say that I shouldn't, that it's somehow problematic for me to use that word. But is it then also problematic when Tyson Junker Porter as an Aboriginal Australian uses the English loan word totem? Well, let's say it's okay for him because he's indigenous, but not okay for me because I'm white and thereby a beneficiary of that social order that has oppressed both Aboriginal Australian and Anishinaabe Native Americans. But if I get my inspiration from Tyson, then what? Am I supposed to racially purify his language in order to not contaminate, delude, degrade, corrupt and mongrelize? Right? Well, for the sake of argument, let's say yes. Let's say that I should do that. But for instance, my Anglophone Baganda friends in Central Africa should not do that because they're indigenous. What then if we imagine the situation that in 2006 I was given a totemic name and taken into a Baganda lion clan who used the English loanword from Anishinaabe, totem, when referring to the Luganda word ikika, which means a totem. May I use it then? Actually having been given a totemic name under the use of the English loanword totem, or does your identitarian resistance to this mongrelization overrule even the cultural practice of an actual totemic group? But cool, let's take it another turn. Let's say that I can use the word because I happen to have been afforded totem clan membership, but you still can't because you're just a white person, but not part of a totem. What then if you are inspired by me? What if I, as a totem clan mem member, pronounce that I actually think you do have the right to use the word totem? What then if somebody made the case that my totem membership is probably just an expression of my white privilege culture tourism that pollutes, bastardizes and mongrelizes people's heritage by reducing it to an exotified, commodified playland and all that? But who exactly has the insight and the legitimacy to actually make that judgment on me? Well, let's say that an objection comes from an Anishinaabe person who says the word belongs to us, the Aboriginal Australians, the Baganda, Runayana and the English language can run along and find themselves another word. This is an argumentation that's related somewhat to what you sometimes hear from Wokians who will sometimes cast it as inherently wrong to translate at all between people, as if it is abusive in itself to call a Sami Nwaidi or an Inuit Angakok a shaman, or to use a word like totem as a translation of Baganda Ikika. Now, I, I think that that is cultural fascism. Translation, sharing under tr understanding between human is incomplete. It does imply alterations of meaning. The opposite is literally philosophically impossible, but it's also existentially viable to do it, and we have to. We have to be in relation. But yeah, still, it's not impossible that you could find an Anishinaabe person who would take such a position, at least on the word totem, perhaps. But then the question becomes, could you also find Anishinaabe individuals who would say, would you please stop the silliness? It's just a word. If you don't have a word for human, non-human kinship group in English, then what's the problem? Like the Anishinaabe scholar Robin Kimmerer, who actively encourages people to try to hack Anishinaabe um, grammar of animacy into the English language, actually. So you see, this can go on at infinitum. And if someone claims some sort of clear lines, and particularly if, if someone works from this identita identitarian idea that cultural groups speak with this unambiguous, unified voice, you know, then I just encourage looking critically at what levels of knowledge and insight the person is speaking from. It seems to me, that a lot of the online criticism against words like shaman and totem is basically driven by outrage culture, not by knowledge or desire to understand. And that's a huge problem of the internet, 
in general, that it's governed by what you could call structural stupidity. What? No! It promotes stupidity processes of the kind that I spoke about in my wokeness video, where often the loudest and most aggressive voices come to set the norms, and that is not the wisest voices. But there's a really important but coming up here on this totem reflection, and that is that the possible availability of words does not extend to culture. For instance, Anishinaabe totem culture? Most definitely not. And that's a really important distinction. The word totem, totemic culture. In fact, that is the reason that we have the concept cultural appropriation to begin with. I'm not familiar specifically with Anishinaabe to to totem culture, but it is not uncommon that totem clans practice exactly those kinds of cultural knowledge that indeed are owned by these clans. Because humans do have kinds of knowledge that is predicated on being communicated in specific contained ways, specific places, and specific rituals. And it is part of this knowledge, inherent to this knowledge, that's supposed to be articulated inside specific relations. This counts for initiatory knowledge, about sacred objects, you know, pipes, bundles, fetish objects, all those kind of things. Taking that kind of stuff out of its relation, that can be an attack on it. If you take a sacred ritual from a totem clan or content from a sacred bonded bundle of fetish and just blast it out on TikTok, then you're violating that knowledge. And it's extremely important to have an unrelenting, unambiguous respect for those kinds of practices and knowledge. And scholars, for instance, they totally haven't always practiced this. I remember, you know, in my student years, I had a professor at the University of Copenhagen who had studied West African uh, masking initiations. And then he made the argument for exposing their sacred knowledge. Another thing about relational culture is that it can have very openly visible elements. For instance, a Maori tamoko tattoo that might mark belonging to a specific kinship group. So if people start using it who don't belong to that kinship group, then its relational meaning is compromised, a bit like the Lakota feather. A relational motif is being torn out of its web of relation where it belongs, and that can be very appropriative. There are also identity markers. And if we leave aside for just a moment the fact that identitarians white or woke identitarians, often want to reduce all culture to be identity markers. Some culture is actually identity markers. And that is more touchy for minorities than it is for majorities. If you want to wear a bowler hat and an umbrella, it doesn't really matter that much that you may not be British. But wearing a Sami national costume, that might feel quite a bit more like imposing on someone who really needs this marking of their identity to affirm and mark their presence inside states that have tried to erase them quite aggressively. This is also tied to a quite specific phenomenon, and that is a history of marginal groups being carnivalized by majority. I even remember doing this as a child myself, uh, and that carnivalizing culture of peoples who have been oppressed is not okay. And therefore also it's great luck that our traditional culture is transformational. We can dress up as something else for our really important carnivals and Halloweens and Yule traditions and all that. This masking of other does not imply a masking of a cultural other and placing them in the same category as Captain Jack Sparrow, Spider-Man and Pikachu. Putting people in this Peter Pan is never Neverland is in fact not only disrespectful, it is one notch up from disrespectful. It is symbolic violence. It's hurting someone with symbolism. But in this context, there's another thing that has to be mentioned, and that's playfulness. Now, playfulness is often a prescribed cultural behavior, you know, though perhaps austere identitarians might tell you otherwise. It's extremely important to allow playfulness to be there. Playfulness holds potential for social change, and it can be difficult to distinguish, probably, from carnivalizing others. I don't have a strict bottom line here, but I would uh, encourage noticing one particular dimension. And this is not a fixed definition, it's just a thought, right? Let's say that we agree 
that we should not use eagle feathers to image Native Americanness in carnivals, right? What then about using a falcon feather to image your own cultural past? Or a crow's feather? Or any feather at all? Or something that has to do in a, with a bird? Or something that can sit on a tree? Or anything that has to do with nature? Now here, some identitarians will sometimes criticize the use of indigenous aestheticism. And when you hear that, I would respectfully invite you to contemplate one thing. Horse shit. There is no such thing as a universal indigenous aestheticism. Look at these two examples of textile patterns here. There are no criteria for you to discern that this one here belongs to an indigenous American groups, and that one there is the traditional expression of a white majority population in a European state. So you see there, there are a lot of difficult distinctions in, in talking about this. On the one hand, we need to accept and respect identitarianism as a legitimate part of people's empowerment struggles. On the other, we need to be wary that identitarians sometimes tend to want to subjugate the totality of human experience with identitarianism. And that can actually compromise owned culture, sacred culture, initiatory culture, for instance. This is an example. Voodoo. In Voodoo you find initiatory knowledge, which is owned by specific houses, initiatory lines, custodians of that knowledge. This kind of ownership is a different thing from going, Voodoo belongs to black people. And that identitarian ownership can compromise initiatory ownership because it can float the knowledge into new and much more open spaces. But here's the thing. Voodoo is also an identity marker. I'm really sorry, but a cultural complex such as Voodoo can have different kinds of ownership associated with it. Voodoo religion is an identity marker of being Haitian. So Haitians do have some kind of cultural ownership over Voodoo. And that does not necessarily always align with the kind of ownership that a Voodoo house or a Voodoo priesthood has over the knowledge that it transfers. And there can be tensions or even struggles in, around a cultural complex about ownership. Now, my suggestion would be to not allow identitarian forms of ownership to cancel out, for instance, initiatory ownership, animist kinds of ownership. Identitarians sometimes try to do that. Extend identitarian ownership as far as they can. In, in my view, it would be the best if different modes of ownership could be allowed to coexist, even if they are in some sort of tension sometimes. Therefore, also struggles about ownership actually sometimes play out with an appropriation rhetoric. That's right. You know, people claiming appropriation sometimes do that in order to appropriate. Here's a wonderful right-wing example. Uh, it's so hilarious. As a leftist, uh, I sometimes envy right-wingers uh, what appears to be some sort of self-irony. We lefties, we have no humor, really. We're so bloody austere and bourgeois. Aren't these alt-right Viking strippers just absolutely wonderful in this sort of unconsciously queer way? Maybe she's born with it. The point of this image is to appropriate the Maori haka by claiming that Maori appropriated the haka from Viking strippers. <laughs> um, yeah, a left-wing example of a similar thing happened when um, the Black Lives Matter movement came to Copenhagen. Uh, they told us that we were not allowed to appropriate the raised fist of solidarity, a symbol that's extremely important in the socialist culture that has thoroughly defined and built this place for the last 150 years. But the Black Lives Matter uh, told us that this symbol now belonged to uh, some American group who started using it in the 1970s. Like going into a context and taking ownership over something that is legitimately part of that context, taking it away from the people there. The people who create these appropriation discourse uh, in that way, uh, they often seem to not really appreciate that culture exchange is precious it's natural, it's human, it's important, it's creole, it's beautiful, and that the counterposition to that is just fucking fascism. If you look, for instance, at indigenous peoples, 
fighting for survival around the world today, then there is a lot of borrowing going on. Bits and pieces of culture is moving about quite a bit. And this is deeply foundational, actually, for decolonizing. Probably because most indigenous people realize that culture is transformational, relational, creole, dynamic. Right? And one example of this is the, um, the Native American Pata Show uh, from Brazil, uh, who they've had this very intense recovery of their ancestral culture, uh, where they have applied Afro-Brazilian religion to recover their Native American spirituality. So would that be wrong if white people did the same? Because white people are located differently in the continuums of social power to the Show. Can a dude like Christian Mo in Norway legitimately become a voodoo priest? Which he did. Well, I think the core question there is what actual ownership is connected to sacred cultural elements. And in this case here, if Christian has been initiated as a voodoo priest, then his practice is transmitted to him in a culturally legitimate way through the right protocols by legitimate custodians of this knowledge. You know, and this kind of examples tend to provoke identitarians because it compromises the universal claim of identitarianism to be the creator word of God, basically. So they would either avoid talking about it or just sort of heap demeaning language in the general direction of Chris's spirituality as inauthentically exploitative, co-opting, commodifying, contaminating, and so on, right? I think that is a deeply problematic practice. Implementing identitarianism in depriving a guy like Christian his legitimacy as a voodoo priest, if you do that, you are cancelling voodoo initiatory ownership and you're doing it actually with the Euro-modernist model, the identitarian model. That is cultural colonialism. But uh, online cultural appropriation discourse often seems to work from this either spoke out, unspoken or sometimes outspoken segregationist proposition that if you're a Euro-descendant person, you cannot engage cultural exchange. And confronted with this observation, many just goes, segregationism? More? I'm a woke leftist. Yes, segregationism. That is indeed the outcome if the bottom line is that you won't stand up for a legitimately initiated white voodoo priest like Christian, who in reality ends up being rejected exclusively uh, on the background of his, uh, on his race or culture. So this practice of universally critiquing white cultural exchange, I think is an incredible problem. Because what people don't seem to notice, or perhaps even to flip and care, is that their cultural appropriation criticisms actually imply a rather catastrophic reproduction of racist structure. That is, white people as this exception thing. White exceptionalism is like this. If the result of your critique practice is turning against pretty much any cultural exchange in which a Europe uh, person can participate, then it doesn't really matter that much that you might have some fluffy abstract idea that cultural exchange can perhaps be legitimate in some transcendent, morally pure, ethereal world where power asymmetries don't exist. If the outcome is banning your descendants from doing what all humans are supposed to do, engage in cultural exchange, then this practice lifts white culture away from all other culture in a really problematic way. White culture is actually being universalized. It becomes this common condition of knowledge in opposition to other culture, which is maintained as exotified, culturally secluded. Let me just give you an example. Freudianism, that's a white cultural complex. It's universally available, accessible to all, it's normalized. But you have to belong to a specific group in order to practice voodoo, which, like Freudianism, is a unique and genius uh, contribution to our age. But that is culturalized, exotic, secluded. It can't aspire to the same kind of intercultural relevance as Freudianism. So even if you are a completely legitimately initiated Norwegian voodoo priest, online voca vegetarians will still accuse you of contaminating, bastardizing, corrupting, and mongrelizing. That upholds the colonial seclusion of voodoo as exotically cultural, 
because it's, it's limited into one cultural group. This also implies a characteristically Eurocentric displacement of animism in favor of culture. Now, an animist position would be that voodoo is knowledge of how to manage and engage subjectivity right, in this world. But Eurocentric colonizer modernism would rather see voodoo as just culture. Freudianism is knowledge, but voodoo is just culture or identity markers and something like that. That is what contemporary indigenous scholarship would diagnose as a colonial uh, knowledge hierarchy. And the problem is that this colonial knowledge hierarchy is being reproduced when people go overboard with cultural appro appropriation criticism. The intention might be to protecting ownership, but the result in practice is reproducing wide exceptionalism. The universal relevance and intercultural availability and relevance is afforded to white culture, but it's kept from other culture like voodoo. Cultural exchange is the life breath of what it means to be human. And we must not just universally condemn it just because th there indeed is at times some shady shit going down in there. It's a bit like some medieval king who's executing the whole village because he knows that there are a couple of heretics in there. We must understand better what cultural appropriation actually is. Also, and not the least, in order to continue criticizing it. Because protecting stuff like Anishinaabe totem clan culture or voodoo initiatory knowledge, I think it's a really, really important struggle of our day. And it does not happen by just shooting identitarian stupidity and condemnation in the general direction of any cultural exchange that involves a Euro descendant. Now, I myself, I find it difficult to give clear and solid criteria that distinguishes uh, between cultural appropriation and legitimate cultural exchange. I've asked a lot of people about it and nobody can give me a definition, particularly not the people who shout the loudest about cultural appropriation. By the way, they totally can't define it, uh, at least not in a solid way. But if you have valid criteria, then stick them in the comment section. I'm really interested. My general thinking is that in order for an exchange to be appropriative, then the property quality of the exchanged cultural element need to change. Also, the origin culture of the element needs to be deprived from it somehow, or deprived from benefiting from it, or the element needs to be devalued or damaged somehow, and that needs to have a certain weight. It cannot just be that it changes a little bit when it moves into a different context. So here's an example. A fashion designer uses a Maori facial tattoo that marks belonging into a Maori noble family. Is the property qualities of this tattoo changed? Yes, it belongs to them. Now it suddenly belongs to everybody. It marks a specific belonging, so it's devalued, it's undermined. Is this a cultural appropriation? Yes. Okay, a slightly more complicated case. Christian Moore is a white guy, and he becomes initiated in a cultural complex, um, which is a marker of black Haitian identity. Could that be appropriation? looks a bit like it. However, voodoo has other models of ownership in it, extremely important models, that transfers ownership in relational, not identitarian ways. Voodoo might, from one perspective, be an identity marker, but oh boy, it's also a lot of other things. Chris has been given his priest status through legitimate transfers of practice by legitimate custodians of this practice, the voodoo temple La Belle Des. That means that criticizing him, that is the problem, because that compromises voodoo ownership. The morally objectionable, objectionable appropriation turns the other way. It's criticizing Chris, which is morally problematic. Let me take just another, even more complicated case, perhaps. Dia de los Muertos, a result of a long history of creolizing, mixing culture, European dance macabre motifs merging with indigenous Mexican stuff. That then becomes an identity marker for the white Mexican state. It becomes Mexican-ness, and this is again brought even further, being associated with the general Hispanic origin. It is a beautiful example of cultural exchange, actually. But if you use Dia de los Muertos symbolism in your existing all Hallows, Winter Threshold, Halloween. You know, are you then damaging the original cultural charge, which is, is not particularly about Mexicanness, but 
is in fact a closely related animist celebration of the flows of life and death on the winter threshold? Well, I would say no. But are you compromising Mexicanness? Well, it's difficult to ask Mexicans. Cultures are these monolithic entities that can take coherent decisions. There are about 150 million Mexicans. They speak about 62 indigenous languages, huge social disparity, conflicts, political social tensions, religious problems, racial groups. Do you think they might have different opinions about stuff? Yeah. Unlike Maori tattooing or voodoo initiation, the problem with Dia de los Muertos is that there isn't an entity of people, an authority that manages ownership over it. It's just there. Uh, that doesn't necessarily imply that there's zero ownership. It just means that, you know, the, the different kinds of ownership. Is it cultural appropriation? Uh, it's complicated, but I would say probably not. Carnivalizing can be a problem, as we, we've mentioned. But carnivals, such as November Day, Halloween celebrations, and Dia de los Muertos, they are themselves valuable, true, beautiful culture, often with an authentic element of cultural exchange inherent to it, right? You see the problem? I would argue that we need to figure out the balancing act of safeguarding cultural exchange while safeguarding cultural ownership. And we need to start saying no when identitarian chauvinisms just heaps derogatory condemnation in the general direction of your descendants being human, meaning engaging cultural exchange. We need to be able to operate in rather concrete terms, but also to allow complexities and even gray zones. Because if we are not to become austere cultural fascists, then we must allow for playfulness. It's actually really important. Yet we must also insist on rejecting carnivalizing colonized peoples. We must understand what ownership and sacrality is, why it can compromise some kinds of culture to just float it all over the place. And we must understand that some kinds of culture floats around a lot. And perhaps it's supposed to be like that. We should also start to question the ways that racist structures are being rehatched in the um, identitarian segregationism that sometimes sort of uh, hides in appropriation criticism. We need to start waking up a little bit more when somebody uses the term appropriation because it's actually regu regularly used to appropriate. And I basically think that the present practice of this important co concept, cultural appropriation, risks undermining it, perhaps fatally, because it's being shot in random direction. And this is uh, important because protecting cultural ownership, for instance, uh, initiatory culture or sacred culture, that is a struggle which is not over. So uh, I hope this all made sense and uh, see you around.